are the cap for whatever goes on in your store, in your company, in your district, in your household, however excited you are, what you believe is possible, whatever that threshold is. <laughs> Hey team, Jim Cripps here with the Charge Forward Podcast coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee here at Hit Lab Studios. I have a special treat for you today. A world-renowned coach just finished up with Team USA, got some big things in the works, and he's had an amazing career, life. Here to tell you all about it, Mr. Bob Learn, also known as Mr. 300. Hey, Welcome, Jim. Bob. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So we go... I'm not going to say way back because I think if you say way back, we got to talk about well, that you, would age us. That would age us, yeah. and we'd have to be talking about when you started your career uh, on tour. But I think you've lived just an amazing life already, and you've got stuff cooking that's just going to blow people's minds. We're not going to spoil it for you. It's going to be at the end, and I mean, just crazy. And I will, I will say this: I was introduced to you. 20 something years ago, not to date us too much, but my dad, right after I started bowling around 2000, he sent me a recording of a video and it had you and Parker Bond and had Johnny Petraglia and several others on it. And it was just kind of all the things about bowling. And of course it showed the clip of you there in Erie, just dominating that day. And you seemed larger than life. I mean, it was just, I would have never believed if we, if we fast forwarded 20 years later, number one, that we would have bowled together several times, that we would become friends, that, you know, all, all these things would have transpired. Um, what was it several years ago that got you into bowling? Well, it's a pretty simple question. I, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, an area of known for its snowfall. And so in the winter... There's few things to do but be inside. And I grew up very close to a bowling center. My parents bowled. Um, and when they got me started, I was fascinated by it. I love it. And I remember you telling me that once you started bowling, like you just wanted, you, as soon as you got out of school, you wanted to get to the bowling center, that it, you had that kind of urge to, to get better and to, to do that every day. I mean, if you will, kind of describe that passion. Well, I mean, it was it was bad, really. <laughs> um, first time I bowled, uh, you know, I was that's all I could think about, it, putting spin on that ball and making it do some crazy things. Even at a young age, I was drawn to that. And my parents got me started in league at eight years old, and that would be on a Saturday morning. And Monday morning, uh, I would be a, a poor student. Because all I could think about is Saturday, getting back to the lanes and having my three games and try it again. That's great. Now, did you practice a lot in between? Well, not early on. Um, uh, but as as time allowed, as I got a little older, I certainly uh, got as much in as I could. In the early days, I had to wait week to week uh, and for my opportunity to get there on Saturday. Oh, that had to seem like a lifetime. It did. It <laughs> did. That's why I was a poor student. But I was daydreaming, you know, about this opportunity. And, and you know, it that dream has never really waned at all. I, I still feel the same way. I look forward to the next opportunity. And uh, I really do think it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that each time you go out there, it's a different it's a different thing. It's not the same every time. Absolutely. Now, and I know we're skipping ahead just a little bit, but, you know, a lot of people struggle with the the kind of the transformation between player and coach. Was that seamless for you, or did that go? Uh, how did that go? It was seamless. Um, it's something that I was always uh, interested in doing, helping others be better, right? Yeah. Um, I felt like I wish I would have had a little bit more of that to draw on as, as a child, mm -hmm. uh, doing what I did, but I certainly could pass on what I became you know, known for and uh, the information I had to offer. I felt like I could really help others doing that. Gotcha. Now, did you have a coach as a, as a kid? Um, just a Saturday morning kind of a, you know, don't miss the head pin kind of guidance. Uh, but, you know, I coached first, not bowling, but uh, with my kids growing up, Little League, uh, baseball, softball, anything that they were involved in, I became at least an assistant 
coach to it because I couldn't always be there, mm -hmm. but I would always be involved. I love it. Now, throughout this, whether we're talking about when you were on tour or when uh, you became a coach, have you had a motto or kind of the code that you live and teach by that, that type of thing? Well, uh, not really a motto, but certainly uh, all things are possible. You know, yeah. I think it's a mindset. All things are possible. And uh, it goes, you know, kind of draws off of our sport mm -hmm. because it's an ever-changing environment. Uh, and there's good and bad, uh, you know, times within the competition. And you always have to be positive. Being an opportunist, you know, when the... Uh, when it arrives, when it arrives to you, right, and and then just be determined to work through those tough spots. And I think, you know, that's really where, I think that's really carried me through a lot of things in life. Mm -hmm. uh, is that all things are possible? Now, did you, was that instilled in you from an early age, or did you develop that? And I, I, did, did did that help you, kind of, strike out on tour? Well. Honestly, it wasn't there in my youth. Uh, I kind of felt that it was the opposite of that. Mm. Um, and I really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough answer, but an easy one at the same time. My mother uh, grew up very poor mm -hmm. and uh, had a lot of baggage with that that she carried through life. And she was a hard worker. She was smart. And she had so much potential. I saw the potential in her. But... Uh, I certainly saw how that held her back because to a certain level she was comfortable uh, and then she felt like the rest wasn't for her. Hmm. And I saw that and I learned from it. Even at an early age, I was very uh, aware of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to be different than that. I wanted to believe that, you know, things can happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, We'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm sure when we talked about my wife Stacy, certainly helped you know help that happen. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, and we'll dive deep into in the spouse selection and how important that is just in in life. But uh, but it's the people that you're that are around you that really help you shape into the person you're supposed to become. Yeah, you talk about it takes a village. It. I mean, there is. That's just a great way to to say it because it does it's not one person it's not two people there's a lot of people that are part of your life at a certain time in your life that help you know develop you yeah. as a person and uh things that you draw off of from you know and can relate to when things are a little rough you can kind of go back and go you know i remember you know this happened or this person said this and you draw from it well, I think understanding that is probably one of the main reasons that you're such a great coach. And, you know, when we first met, we were talking about 2007, I believe it was, and we were going to bowl a bowl fest event. You were working for USBC back then and putting these events on. They were a trick shot show. And they had called me because of my unique style. <laughs> That's yeah, well put. And I, I never will forget. And I'm so thankful for this. You didn't cut me any slack. And what I mean by that is for a lot of people, the fact that I bowled backwards was enough. And as soon as you saw me bowl, the next question was, what kind of trick shots do you have? And back then I was struggling. So I was so putting so much effort into being taken seriously that the idea of doing a trick shot was so foreign. And you said, Jim, I mean, every great bowler's got trick shots. And so, I mean, in my head, I was like, okay, if I ever get invited to do this again, I'm going to have trick shots. And you did. When you came <laughs> back, you had uh, more than one. Uh, really, really cool. You definitely spent time on it. And, and I realized that, you know, it really came from the fact that we thought – what you did was unique enough that it should be showcased, mm -hmm. right? Because it was a draw for people. And if you were able to throw some trick shots, you could do things that no one else does in trick shots because of your style. And that that would be a great draw. And it would just bring more people, uh, you know, attention to bowling. And that's what it was all about. Yeah. The bowl fest was about, you know, just bringing more attention to the sport. Well, and, you know, the pressure that I see, especially, especially in trick shots, and I get that I think the same is true 
under the lights when it comes on, when the tour comes on TV, you know, on the weekends is nobody comes to see things tried. They come to be amazed. And, and again, I think it's whether we're talking about trick shots or whether they're talk, talking about the pros bowling, you know, there on TV, they want to be amazed. And that's what the draw is. Uh, no different than us watching our, our favorite, uh, you know, home run sluggers or, or, or whatever the sport. And so I took those trick shots very seriously. Well, you know, I met a, a gentleman named Andy Verapapa who was mm-hmm. known for trick shots uh, still to this day. And, and a lot of the stuff that he did was in the 50s and 60s mm-hmm. uh, that's still in black and white out there and still amazing shots. And I had lunch with him, and he was like 93, right before he passed uh, in Long Island. And uh, I just asked him about his trick shots, how he did this, how he did that. And uh, in our conversation, he says, you know, son, uh, it, to me, people expected me to throw strikes if I did an exhibition. Mm-hmm. But if I shot 220 or 230 or 240, those are bigger scores back then. Um, you know, they probably really wouldn't remember that because mm-hmm. it was expected. But when I threw a, a couple balls, uh, you know, with one hand or one in each hand, you know, something they would, re- would remember forever. And just remember that, you know, if you're in a position to be able to uh, get in front of people, create some trick shots, do some things that will amaze them. Yeah. Well, I think my favorite part, and I've, I've said this in interviews before, my favorite part about doing trick shots is when you do a trick shot, that look of wonder that a child has you see that on adults. True. And it's almost completely erased once, once you know, somebody reaches teenage years. But when you see a 40, 50, 60, 70, 80-year-old person have that same look of wonder and disbelief that you see on children, it changes you. And that's why I love trick shots. And, and I really look at it as that's the gift that you gave me in the sport of bowling. Because without that push, I would not have. Well, you know, with uh, social media today, Mm -hmm. it's all about seeing something you haven't seen before that amazes you and people, you know, get likes for for that, you Mm know. Uh, We just didn't have social media back then. (laughs) We just had to do it live. And like you said, it had to be good when you did it or it it wasn't meaningful. Uh, So you want to be practiced at it. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think that's that's a trust thing too because, you know, we all have our pinnacle moments and, you know, for me, a lot of people would think it would be the world's first 300 backwards and don't get me wrong. I needed to check that box and it was a great day, but the pinnacle for me was Valentine's day, 2009 bowling with you guys in Vegas. And it's because bowl fest happened to be between the, the masters. So the masters was, was it the masters or the open? The open. The Open, so it was um, the day before the finals, and so you had everybody that made their money, made made their living in bowling, was in that building, and the guy that didn't fit was me, <laughs> and I can remember we were practicing, and, uh, you know, a little bit of a crowd started building up of professionals, and to you, it was nothing, and to Brian Voss, it was nothing, you know, you guys had seen me bowl a lot. And to have these other guys and, and ladies, you know, stop and pay attention because, you know, that, that's the who's who of bowling. And so, you know, we go live the next night and the first three trick shots were missed because I won't name names, but there was another act there and they didn't let us practice. And, uh, you know, you can't miss trick shots. <laughs> In in front of a live crowd, and so number four, I'm up, and after that, we just started knocking down trick shots one after the other. The bowling gods were looking down on us with favor that day too, uh, but it was just uh, it was an amazing night. We had we had a lot of fun. Well, you know the thing about trick shots is uh, most trick shots that we're trying to do in front of crowds uh, aren't allowed mm-hmm. in a bowling center, right? You know, so you can't do too much of that in front of anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Bowling Center, knowing that you're there for that reason, will allow you to do them, but you can't practice them out and have people try to copy it. Yeah. You know, so that makes it a little difficult. So, yeah, when we get to these locations, we need to have a little time 
to practice it because we really don't get a lot of time to perfect it. Uh, we've done it in the past, but you, you still need warm up for it. You do. And to, so to come into that cold and, you know, a couple trick shots missed, a couple people that don't normally throw trick shots, you know, we, we've talked about that. And, you know, I, I, again, I'm very thankful for the fact that you kind of put that task on task on me that I needed to come with trick shots. And so I was ready and we had a lot of fun. I mean, it was, I, I can remember being on cloud nine after we hit all those trick shots, just back to back to back to back. Yeah, I mean, you know, even as uh, someone who does trick shots, to see someone else do a different trick shot, it's like, wow, he just did that? You know, so it's it's just an amazing thing, even for myself, who, who does trick shots, to see someone else do something different. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now, it has not been just easy, clear sailing through your career and all these things. You've absolutely had some bumps along the way. And, you know, one of the, the main spirits of the Charge Forward podcast is our guests have a default to charge forward and to get through it. What would you say is one of the biggest things that you had to overcome or had to push through uh, through your career or and transition to, to coaching? I mean, I don't think we have enough time to talk about that. <laughs> sports, you know, that is sports, right? Mm-hmm. You can have, there's an ebb and flow of, of positive and negative things that happen to you, but to persevere through that. It, I mean, it is the power of positivity. Mm-hmm. There is really no other uh, recipe for it. You ha- you believe that things can get better, and uh, you're optimistic, eternally optimistic. That's certainly something that I feel I am uh, uh, definitely optimistic. No matter what, there's something good to draw from, and it may you may have to go down a little ways and find something so small, but it's positive that you want to focus on. And if you start thinking about the negative and Oh, well, you know, what was me and, and everything, then you're going to go down that rabbit hole and that's not where you want to be, you know? Yeah. Right. So I've not met too many people that have found success by thinking negatively. Mm-hmm. Right. But I love being in a room of positive people. It's so easy to pick out what's wrong with something, but I want to be around people that say, this is how we fix it. Yeah. Let's be a part of this, the positive. Absolutely. Um, now, I, and I don't know what the numbers are, but how many people would you think that you have certified to become a bowling coach to this point? Oh, I don't know what the number is either. Um, I mean, it's, it's a lot of people, um, and it's not enough. It's I not wanted, enough. No, no, I want, I want to get as many people as I can in that field because it helps grow the sport. Um. You know, how many people have you been in front? How many people have you coached? Uh, thousands, yeah. but still not enough looking for the next opportunity. Well, and, you know, one of the things that I thought was, I, I don't, looking back on it, I don't know that it was that interesting, but I just don't know how often it had been done before. This would have been 2008 or 2009. Uh, during one of those events, obviously where everybody was there, it may have been Vegas, and... I thought it was interesting that you were you took that opportunity to certify these professional bowlers as a group, take them all through coaching as a way to get a lot of coaches certified and continue to grow the sport. Uh, how did that kind of come about? Well, I knew that I was able to influence a lot of people because of my gra- background as a professional mm-hmm. athlete, right? Yeah. I guess become more believable in some of the things I was saying because I had more insight in certain aspects of the sport um so when i worked for usbc i had a budget that i could use toward you know anything promotional Mm -hmm. and i felt strongly that i should be spending all of it uh at least in the the early uh, years there in trying to get other people like myself certified to go out there and make impressions on others and so i offered different levels of uh, certification Mm -hmm and paid for it also gave them some presentation materials to be able to go out there and do it and then ask them just to do their part which Mm -hmm. was just a couple events a year and if we did that times how many people that were getting certified i'll be at 50 60 at a time um we could have impact and we did have impact and so again it's about being positive influence and in our case, it's in the sport of bowling. You know, I think um, 
probably using just slightly different words, but I think you and I both use kind of the same lens is, is it good for the sport of bowling? And anytime I was asked to do an event or, you know, speak at something or, or do those things, I would I'd try to use that lens because it was real easy for people to, to say that I was bad for the sport. And so, uh, you know, I worked really hard to try to be accepted and then also to check that box for being good for the sport. And I think a lot of the things, well, I mean, pretty well everything you've done throughout your career, whether it was as a, as a professional on tour or just a, an advocate for the sport or a coach, you know, really, I think that's, that's the lens that you use. Well, if I lived by other people's opinions, <laughs> we don't. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd get as nearly as far as I've gotten um, because uh, you fall under their belief system, mm-hmm. right? Who they believe you should be falls in line with uh, you being a little bit less than they are in a lot of cases. And I don't buy into that at all, right? Uh, I'm going to be who I believe I can be, be the best version of me. Mm-hmm at all times so opinions though i do listen to them uh you know i don't i don't really take it in and live my life by it yeah absolutely now you've done some amazing things most recently uh just back from uh, coaching team usa how'd that go well you know it's always amazing working with the best athletes in america um getting to spend time with them uh certainly be able to draw uh off of some of my past experiences as a player as well for Team USA. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we had a lot of success uh, getting to see them in those moments where they are tested and then uh, come through with flying colors, if you will. Um, It's amazing. And I love being part of those moments. And as a coach now, I I still get to be, you know, involved in those moments because I am throwing every shot as they are, right? I'm living through every shot. And I told them, you know, at the end of our days are 14, 15 hours Mm -hmm. and their days are half of that because we have different divisions competing. Uh, They are even saying I'm beat. I'm like, you should throw every shot of every player. You're beat throwing just your own, but I get it because you're putting everything you have into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as a coach, you are, you're really wearing it on your sleeve the whole time. And, but I, I enjoy it. You know, it, it's meaningful. It's impactful. And to be a part of it is just, it makes you feel alive. It's one of those things that is exhausting, but also gives you fuel. Yes, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So yep. at the end of the day, you're just, you're completely wiped out. 100%. You know, one of my favorite things about having done those events with you guys, um, you know, which has now been 15 years ago, which is, seems crazy, but the it was the after event when we all went to dinner, you know, you, you got ever, you know, Carolyn, you got, uh, Carmen yourself, Brian Voss, like just all these amazing people that have done amazing things in the sport and to hear you guys tell stories and, you know, just kind of blow off steam. Uh, to me, that was, that was beyond the actual, um, you know, throwing the ball and, and getting the result and seeing the crowd that to me was my second favorite part because just the experiences of everybody, I mean, you're kind of getting to live a little bit, little piece of that. It's my favorite part as well. <laughs> you know, as much time as I can get in, in a room and, and talk about things and tell stories. I mean, that's just, that makes it, you know, it just an awesome experience, even for someone who's been part of it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's a sport that um, hasn't always got uh, full respect um, and certainly during the nineties, we were, were at our apex mm-hmm. and, and we had a lot of people watching us on TV when we proceeded to why roll the sports, which is a great program. Everybody sat on Saturdays and watched bowling mm-hmm. prior to that. And, uh, you know, when that went away, things changed dramatically. So we talk about the good old days and they truly were because of where bowling was at that time. Well, you know, as an optimist, you know, I feel this way and I, 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 we haven't talked about this, but I feel like every opportunity that we have in order to positively impact bowling, we're, we're, we're trying to give it that chance to have, have a new heyday. And, you know, I think one of the big things that I saw you do is, 
you know, you, you went into a college that did not have a program and built the program from the ground up and within just a couple of years uh, had, had real success. So if you will kind of, kind of walk us through how that opportunity presented itself and, and, and the experience. When you, uh, when you first met me, I was part of the coaching department at USBC and um, part of what we saw positive in our sport was the fact that college programs were growing and high school was kind of supporting that because high school bowling was growing. In fact, the fastest growing sport in both high school and college. Um, and we put an importance on what that meant for our sport. So when I left the department, my ambition was that I wanted to be part of this movement. And college was certainly something that I was interested in. When I left USBC, I went to Michigan and ran a training center as well as uh, was involved in sales with a company in Michigan. Uh, but my eyes were always set on a, the right college program. Uh, the program that I did end up uh, reaching out to, it had been established, but it was very small, mm. right? It hadn't really uh, had a lot of success. They had some success, but it was like the kind of program I wanted to be a part of. I didn't want to go in and manage a program that's already known and already, you know, able to recruit whoever to keep them strong. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to go in and, and find people that were under the radar, grow them as players, as people, and be able to build something special. And that's, that's really what we got to do there. Um, we went from 13 active players uh, when, I, when I arrived, and there were some there was actually some good talent sitting there. They just needed help. Well, my wife uh, helped quite a bit in uh, this endeavor. We ended up building up to 48 kids in a program, uh, having five teams that traveled in conference events. And then, of course, tier one events and whatnot, we traveled with just varsity. But it didn't take us long to start winning. And I knew that I was in the right space that I was able to take all this uh, experience that I had as a player as I gained in the coaching a world that I could actually have an impact in this arena. And, you know, we were number one in the country when the program closed. Uh, and that's a whole nother story in itself. But we were number one. So we came a long way, uh, which was fulfilling. Uh, and I have such great connections with my players. Uh, they still reach out weekly, if not daily. So it's great to have that kind of impact in other people's lives. Well, and it's not just a blip in time. I mean, you, you've, you've been out of that program for over a year now. Yeah. And still you talk to those players daily, weekly. You know, you're part of their life. You're part of You change the direction for many or possibly all of them. Well, I certainly instilled belief in oneself, yeah. you know, let, you know, made them believe. Yeah. Initially we weren't that team, mm -hmm. but getting them to believe that we were, uh, and then walking in and realizing that in fact we were that team for people to be, and people looked at us like that, uh, for them to see that transformation in themselves, yeah. you know, was amazing. And I think. Uh, I know, I should say I know, uh, from conversations with them that they appreciate that time that we had together, uh, that they felt that it really trans it was transformational for them. Do you think that the, one of the reasons that that's such a big part of what you bring to the table as a coach is that mindset shift? Because you had to have that mindset shift yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I came from a small town. Um, in an area that no one had ever gone out on tour and made it uh, up until, you know, I was an adult player. Then a few of us went out and had success. Mm -hmm. But uh, when someone, you know, you're talking to says, well, if you can't go out there and beat those people, no one, no one from here ever has going back to people's opinion mm -hmm. and say, no, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make this happen and go out and do it and then prove it to yourself that, in fact, that you, you, you did it because of the power of positive thinking and hard work uh, that you can make that 
that that's a recipe for success for anyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit and I'm going to address everybody and say this next part, please pay attention to this. It is just incredibly impactful for your life. Bob, how important is it to have the right partner, to have the right spouse that supports you, that, that you live this life with all the way? I mean, it's everything for me. I can speak on that. Um, going back to what I said was a difficult answer mm -hmm. was to talk about some of the thoughts that I was uh, dealt, you know, growing up mm -hmm. and the fact that it's not for us, you know, it's not going to happen, you know, and in kind of pigeonhole uh, thinking, mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> my sister worked in a salon and I came home for a free haircut and mm -hmm. there was this new girl in the salon and uh, I asked my sister uh, who this new girl was and, and if uh, you could ask her if she was busy because I think I want to meet her and see if she'll uh, cut my hair for me. And, and I met this girl named Stacy and uh, we went on a date the next night and, uh, well, it changed my life. Um, she's been such a great support. She, the first thing she said to me is like, um, you throw this ball amazing and why haven't you done more in a sport? And I'm like, wait, what? Uh, no one had ever quite said it to me like that. And her belief in me uh, in all things uh, sense and, and following whatever, um, you know, path I was taking in believing in that, that and supporting that is, has been amazing. And it's not easy to find someone like that. Mm -hmm. She has supported me from day one. The other is she gave me purpose. We had a family. And that never let me say I quit, mm -hmm. right? Because it was having that whole, uh, you know, package that you needed to drive you right. because you couldn't give up. You had to keep going. You had to keep going and work harder. And But she always supported that. And she, in fact, uh, would be like, what are you doing today? I'm like, well, I thought I'd take the kids. Well, don't you have to practice? You know, like, no, go practice first. Mm -hmm. We'll be okay. We'll wait to get back. And, you know, I had a pretty uh, strong regimen as far as how much time I put uh, into it. And uh, she didn't want that to change. Even when I became comfortable on tour and made uh, quite a bit more money, she's like, no, that's what got you there. Mm -hmm. You can't now just kick back and go, I made it because you're going to fall right back. So she saw that and she made me work harder than, uh, you know, I wanted to simply because I wanted to be with my family more. And she understood that. But. She said, no, you're doing this for us. You're going out there and you're doing this for us. So you are taking care of your family. Yeah. No, I love it. And I think we think very similar in that regard because I do think it is the most important decision of your life is who you choose to spend your life with and the life that you build together. Um, and so good, bad, or ugly, <laughs> you know, it, it is that important. And I think we both got just incredibly lucky. You know, the, the, the heavens shined out on us and we, we, we found the person we were supposed to be with. My favorite story of you and Stacy is that day in Erie, 1996. You're crushing it, but she reminded you that there was more on the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you're referring to the day that I, um, I broke all the records mm -hmm. on... ABC Sports, which still stands today. I love it. Uh, and going back to, like you said, a device moment, um, I had just bowled a perfect game the first game in front of my hometown crowd on a $100,000 bonus, right? And, of course, I'm just like, oh, my God, what a great moment, blah, blah, blah. And you get caught up in that uh, because you're so excited about what just happened. And we went out of uh, commercial break and started our next match, and I had not struck twice on the same lane starting our match. And uh, we went back to commercial break. And she's like, what are you, what are you doing? I mean, what do you mean? What am I doing? I just pulled 300 and, and uh, won 100,000. I mean, this is great. She goes, no, no. You need to figure this out because you're not here just for that. You've always wanted to win in your hometown. 
you need to figure something out because you didn't strike twice on that lane. And I sat and I thought about it. And I'm like, wow. Okay, so I just threw perfect game. But I do need to make a change. It's, it's evident. Um, okay. So I made a choice uh, to a ball actually that wasn't working that well in practice. But I knew that it was going to give me the ball motion I needed now. And came out and struck out that game to win by a pin. 269 against my 270. So it was at the right time. Uh, it made me look uh, at really what the big picture was mm -hmm. versus the moment that I was living in. So, yeah, it had. I would never have had all those records if she hadn't uh, kind of set me straight in that moment. But I, I think historically, when that has been done on, on television, that was the end for many. Mm -hmm. They didn't win the next because, you know, you have a lot going on in your mind. You're, you're not as focused as you needed to be. But she... She reset my focus, uh, and uh, as the day went on, I was put into some pretty uh, unique situations where I had to really prove myself in the 10th each game, and it couldn't have been uh, really a better day to be able to prove yourself as an athlete. In fact, Chris Shankle, who was the voice of the PBA and a voice that I wish I could hear still today uh, in the PBA uh, broadcast, mm -hmm. you know, broadcast room um he said to me and he had covered sports of you know i mean every sport yeah he was well known and he came up to me he goes bob he goes that is the greatest and most uh, impressive individual um display performance that i've ever seen in sport and i'm like what chris shankle just told me this uh and i'll never forget that I love it. I, again, I, I think it's one of those things that goes back to the people that really care about you hold you accountable. And, you know, obviously Stacy is an amazing partner, you know, and, and she held you accountable at the right time. There wasn't a moment to waste. Right. Because that was going to be a dog fight all the way to the end. And, it was. But you were up to the task. And I think a lot of that was mindset. A lot of that was the training regiment. Um, you know, I remember having a conversation all those many years ago and he said, you know, I was, I was bowling a minimum of 20 games a day and that blew my mind. But then at the same time, if you look at what kind of pressure you are under when you are on tour, how many games you're going to bowl and you've got it, you can't be exhausted in that. You've got to be at your peak. Right. We do 50 in a, in a four day period, yeah. you know, of competition, which is worse than just going out there and throwing it right. Mm -hmm. As far as taxing, cause it's mental as well um yeah so you're conditioned to do what you do it doesn't matter what sport you are you need you need to condition yourself in that right yeah um and so yeah i can honestly today i could still bowl 20 games in a day you know i'm 62 and i don't have any problems doing that because it's been my whole life yeah uh training like that so but you've also stayed in pretty good shape too you know, part of it is just the training regimen that you've had, but also, I mean, it's a conscious effort because there's plenty of 62 year olds out there that are not in anywhere near the shape that you are. And for them to go out and bowl a couple games would, would be something. But I think just pretty much any sport, if you wanted to go out and do it, you wouldn't have any hesitation. No, not at all. No. In fact, you know, where we lived in Pennsylvania, um, we had a, a nice property and we had a lot of things going on. We had a lot of friends coming over, and we had a lot of activity. Uh, volleyball, uh, we had a regulation, you know, court set up in our backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived on a golf course, and we had a lot of space behind it. Uh, so, you know, we did, we did just stay active all the time. And if someone asked me today, hey, you want to go play volleyball? Yeah, absolutely. I would jump in. I'm like, of course. And I wouldn't quit until they quit. You know, and then, um, you know, my kids are the same way. You know, they've trained, uh, I guess, under that same belief system mm -hmm. that all things are possible. And, you know, it's, my daughter's a softball player. Uh, they won states in Pennsylvania, which is the uh, first state title for our school. Uh, so, you know, but she never, you know, thought any other way than, yeah, we can do this. You know, and she was big on that, and she's very successful in life. She's a head 
fashion designer in New York City, and uh, she never looked back. She believes that all things are possible. And my son is really successful and uh, believes that all things are possible. And we just don't live in a space of negativity, you know. And what do you draw that's that it's good from that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think probably the greatest gift is the fact that not only was I introduced to more positive people, but then I was able to actually make that, you know, something that I get to pass on to my kids. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because that's, that's why we do these things, right? And don't get me wrong, there's, there's a selfish part of it. We want to experience life. But as soon as you become a dad, then it becomes about how do, how do I best represent to inspire them to live the best life they could possibly have. Right. And I, I remember us having that kind of conversation before I had kids. You know, I can remember us, this would have been Albuquerque, I think, 2007. And I think Brittany was just about ready to graduate high school. Yep. And, you know, looking at going into college and, and those types of things. And I remember you just lighting up about talking about her and Brandon both, just all the things they had going on. And I wasn't a dad yet. So I, I didn't, you know, I could see it in, in the way that you talked about them. But I think it's something that you have to feel at first person before you really understand it. It gives your life purpose. It does. It does. Um, it's not just about you, right? Uh, there's a great responsibility that goes along with that. But, yeah. it's If someone said, you know, what makes, what's one thing that you can uh, say that made you feel successful in life? It was my family. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well... And I think that's also why you have such a passion for coaching because I know at least for me, when I'm coaching someone in, in the most passionate space that I, that I work in, it's almost like I'm parenting that person. And I think, I think you've found the same. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you're, you, well, one, you're, you're trying to get them to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're, you know, you're trying to draw off of how you want to, you know, talk to your own children, right? You want yeah. them to believe that all things are possible. They can, they can achieve this. And the great thing is when you see them starting to blossom, because you have instilled that thought that made them believe they could be better than they are Yeah. and that they see that success. And the greatest payback is that you do see the smile. You do see them light up, you know, it makes it worthwhile for sure. Uh, when I wake up, I can't wait to do it again because I know I have another opportunity for it. That's right. And, uh, you know, I think the calls that you get from your, your you know, the kids that you coach through uh, through college and other other programs, you, you, get to see, you get that feedback. You know, for me, one of the things that I, I attacked when I uh, was, was running a big company here in Nashville is I taught my team members how to manage their money and about – a month and a half ago, I got the 11th phone call that a team member had paid off their house. That's awesome. And, you know, much like you changing someone's mindset, that's kind of that's what I was doing in that space is changing their mindset that they can own a home, that they don't always have to have a payment, that you can do this. And, you know, once you give that person hope in one area of their life, it carries through to the others. So you're, you're teaching that, yes, in the sport of bowling, but they're, they're going to grow that mindset so that they believe anything's possible. Right. I mean, that it's okay for them to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's another piece of that, you know, because a lot of people do get to a level of comfort, and it usually is uh, extended from what they knew growing up. Mm -hmm. And it kind of puts them in that space. And that's okay if they're happy, but uh, without realizing that that becomes their comfort yeah. and that there's more for them if they want it and believing in the fact that it's okay uh, for you to be more successful than that. Yeah. Performance matters. And I think people in sports understand that. And the further you're removed out of sports, a lot of times it's missed. And so I, I think that, you know, youth sports is very critical to teach that piece. Yeah. You know, uh, and you know, this kind of gets into our, what we, th things we think, but do not say uh, segment, but you know, it's okay for performance to matter. And, you know, we've kind of watered this society down a bit to where everybody wants a participation trophy and, and nobody wants to keep score and, and all these things. 
And at the end of the day, you don't want to be, you don't want to get to the end of your life and have accidentally ended up with a participation trophy. You want to have lived and, and be able to kind of hang your hat on these pinnacle moments that shaped your life. Yeah. That you be, that you got to do things you never initially dreamed that could happen. Yeah. That you were able to, yeah, like you said, um, not looking to just stop there, but there's other things that, that you never dreamed possible and going out there and, and achieving those things. And yeah, I mean, you can't say enough about that. Um, you know, I, I had people from my hometown when I first moved away and I, I love living there and I, I loved everybody there. I'm a people person and, um, I enjoy, uh, talking to people and knowing more about who they are and what they're, what makes them tick. Mm-hmm. But when I left there, I had a lot of people going, you moved away. Like, you can't leave. I'm like, what do you mean I can't leave? They're like, well, I mean, you don't care about, I'm like, I have nothing to do with it. There's places I want to go and I can't get there. If I stay here, I have to go somewhere else to make it happen. Uh, And I really thought that was strange, but it goes back to uh, being comfortable, wanting to be around people. You really have to be able to separate yourself from that and go, if I'm going to get there, I'm going to have to be uncomfortable for a little bit uh, to achieve that. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck as they don't want to be uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Nobody. Everybody wants to be in their comfort space, but you have to get uncomfortable if you're going to achieve something else that you obviously goes right back to not believing and or believing that you can. Well, that's where growth happens. Growth happens when you get uncomfortable, whether we're talking about a college kid coming to your school and you know maybe it's way I, I think you had one student that was a long way from home and you know first time away all the things i mean that's scary for that guy yeah, but man. what an experience to step into that's where mama learn came in right that's Stacey right being that mother figure for many of them and, and you know showing uh love you know re- truly love caring about them mm-hmm. making sure that they're getting their work done you know, because we can't keep them around if they're not getting their work done. That's right. And Stacy was very much the same with our own kids. Like, no, you need to study. You need to do this. She's very black and white in how she operates. I'm more, I run off more off of passion, and she's more black and white, which balances us, right? That's right. And keeps me in check a little bit because um, I do anything for anyone. She goes, hey, I know you're like that, and, and I, I love you for that, but. Um, there's a, you got to, you know, you got to give yourself a little bit more time mm-hmm. for yourself and for us, you know, and, and, uh, in any event, uh, she showed that to them. They felt that from them. They appreciated that because she, again, was mom and made it more comfortable for them. Oh yeah. And she was integral in that college program. I mean, to, to put credit where credit is due. And I, I know you, you talk about her all the time. She made that thing. I mean, she stepped in, started helping coaching all, all the things she, she not only mothered them, but she coached them too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I've had a number of people, not a few, a number that have said, man, your wife supports you like none, no other, you know? And I said, she does. Mm-hmm. She does. We're, we're a team, you know? And, uh, I still call her a girlfriend after all these years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just can't imagine life without her. Oh, no, absolutely not. And and I think that's the key is you guys are a team. And, you know, that was one of the reasons Emily and I, w- we got married kind of late in life is as I was kind of going through early life, my parents were a great team. They still are today. And it's not one of those things where they're not great individuals. They're both great individuals. They don't have to have each other, but they are better together than they are apart. And I think you and Stacy are the same way. For sure. Like, it's the yin and yang. It's, it's you know, she's more black and white. You're more fueled by passion. But together, you've built this amazing life, raised two amazing kids. Now you got grandkids in the mix. You've raised a college program. You've, you've helped so many others, uh, you know, live out their dreams on tour. And you've got some big boy exciting things coming up, too. Another chapter. Another yes. chapter. Yeah. Uh, one heck of an adventure. So do we want, do we want to share with, with everybody today what, uh, what that looks like? Sure. 
All right. And you talk about getting out of your comfort, right? Oh, it's way outside the comfort zone. Yeah. So, you know, I've gotten through the sport, I've gotten to travel the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, oddly enough, there's one state I haven't been in yet, which is Maine. Okay. Uh, but I've been to so many countries mm -hmm. uh, through this wonderful sport. Uh, I was given an opportunity recently uh, to become national coach for United Emirates, Arab em Emirates. And uh, so I'll be living in Dubai. I accepted it. Uh, I was there four years ago. Wonderful place. It's really an amazing place. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was signing on to, uh, but it gives me a whole nother experience now, not just as a, a Team USA coach and working with the best in our country, but now I'm getting experience at an international level coaching, mm -hmm. uh, which will be a whole nother dynamic in itself. So it, and it honestly will fill, I guess, my resume because I've done, you know, all these other things, but that was one left. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm going to go for it and I'm excited for it. Um, I know the, the very first event that we have is only two weeks into when I arrive. We'll be in Cairo for like 11 days, so I get to see the, the pyramids. And who wouldn't want to see that, right? Um, and it's going to take me to many places that I haven't been yet mm -hmm. and to be able to work with people I haven't worked with yet and then inspire, hopefully, a whole nother group of people uh, to be you know more in love with this sport, grow the sport, in uh, the country, they certainly are about trying to grow sport. Uh, it, they have success in the program. They've had success. They had a friend of mine, Mika Koivinemi, mm -hmm. from, originally from Finland, but he's lived in the States for many years, mm -hmm. uh, leaving that program after seven years. Okay. So I know it's been in good hands that I can go in, but that even talking to um, you know Mika, he's like, hey, man, they're looking for you to go in and do your thing. And bring new things to the program so don't don't really you know think about what i've done mm -hmm. be you go in there and and make the changes happen so what an, what an incredible compliment from him yeah it's, you, you know to not say hey this is how i've run it you know a lot of people would pat it right yeah and he's saying no you're next they need your you signature on it yeah 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 so i'm i'm excited um i know it's uh quite a ways from home um, I will be able to come back and forth and my kids have already said they'll come visit. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'll see how long I can endure that. Um, uh, I don't, it'll be moments of loneliness, of course, being separated, but, uh, in today's world, you can't keep connected. So that's right. Uh, it makes it easier than ever. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, one of the things that I, I I've noticed about you over the last, whatever, tw almost 20 years is whether whether you feel it or not, I feel like you've never met a stranger. I mean, you can walk into a room and and literally you're just one conversation to the next and and got a couple new you know new friends. And so I think especially with the size of the size of the American population there in Dubai, I think it's going to be like a second home. Yeah, there's a lot of expats that live there. There's certainly I think it's three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So there's. There's a, many people that you get to meet while you're over there. Um, and I've already had three reach out to me that I was unaware that spend time there. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to come. I'll see you. We'll get together. But I'm like, okay, this makes it better, right? Um, yeah, it's it's been a wonderful life. And I know there's more uh, that I can that I can reach for here. And, and I'm just looking to embrace that. I'm going to miss a lot of people from this area. Mm -hmm. um, Columbia, Tennessee is a wonderful place place um and so was you know erie pennsylvania and in florida where i've lived and uh i've enjoyed every bit of that but you're right um i really don't feel like i've ever met a stranger there's always something to talk about there's always something to connect to yeah and uh oddly enough when i was a kid i was shy mm. i was shy but it goes back to believing you know that i was good enough and at a certain point, I came out of that shell. And certainly going out on tour when I was young opened me up to that. That, wait, you know, this is, there's a whole different thing out here. Because you had a lot of people that believe they were. Yeah. Could be. Oh, yeah. And, and were because of it. So, yeah. But I went from a very shy person to, uh, yeah, meeting any, any and everyone and, and connecting. Yeah. Now, uh, 
to connect a little bit for our bowlers out there that are watching, your style was way different when you came on tour than, than, than the other guys out there. And I think we talked about this a few years ago. You kind of felt like it led to why you were able to play for so long. Mm-hmm. And so if you will kind of shed some light on that, you know, you were, you were not the norm when you came out. Well, the sport, you know, was taught a certain way. Um, and I didn't fit that mold. Um, I was always felt, you know, that legs are important in every sport. And I was a, a, definitely a leg player. Mm-hmm. I use my legs a lot. And um, it's just like if you're throwing a baseball and you're not stepping into the throw, uh, you know, you're not powerful. And that weighs ounces. And here we are with a 15 or 16 pound ball. Yeah. And they're teaching or telling me not to use my legs. I thought that was absurd. I'm like, no, I, I definitely need to use my legs. And so, yeah, people looked at it like, this is really weird or different. But I was really trying to emulate one of the players uh, I knew growing up, Marshall Holman, mm-hmm. who really brought a lot of energy uh, to the sport. And the only th- difference was he held the ball down and had his opposite hand on that to support the weight. And mine was just l- holding on to it with one hand. But honestly, similar situation as far as p- posture, footwork, uh, swing, uh, all that was very close when if you compare it, even mm-hmm. though it looked different because I was just holding it with one hand. In fact, our sport with two-handed bowling being you know, the way of the world now, in fact, the last camp I had with the youth at USA um, men's camp, 16 of the 18 were two-handed. Wow. That's a big change. Yeah, and everyone goes, oh, two-handers, you know, you know, they're doing this to the game, this and that. Well, I hate to tell you, but I might be one of the only one-handed bowlers that actually existed, right? Because yeah. I never even had my second hand on it. Uh, so we were all two-handed bowlers to a certain point in our, in our sport, in our game. But, yeah, I was talked down from that. In fact, I, I, people tried to change me. Mm-hmm. That helped me in coaching. Because I was not looking to make someone fit a mold, but to make them a better player than what they were doing what they do. Yeah, Certain things have to be in place, but you don't need to look like that person. In fact, let's look at it for what it is. You can find the best players ever, and they all look different. Mm -hmm. So why are we trying to put them into this one little box, trying to make them look the same? doesn't make sense. Sure. Well, and I mean, that's across any sport. That's across anything is when you, when you get to that elite level, they're not going to fit the mold. There will be some that do, but there's always going to be these nuances. And so for us in any sport to really just clamp down on somebody and go, no, that's not how you do it. Now, obviously some things, I mean, I wouldn't tell somebody to go learn how to bowl backwards. That's, (laughs) that's probably not, uh, not the direction to go, but you know, these nuances coaches are there to help improve but not necessarily flip it on its head. Right. Well, look at the Fosbury flop. What did that do to the sport, right? You have this this guy who would have been, like, laughed at, mm-hmm. you know, like, what are you doing? Until he could achieve greater heights. And they go, wait a sec. Wait a sec. He's doing something here. Much like two-handed when mm-hmm. it was introduced. Like, what is this? This is a joke, right? Yeah. But as we see it, it's more efficient. Um, and we see that efficiency find its way to the top of our sport. So, uh, you know, going back to people's opinions, yeah, guided by opinion or belief that, you know, what you're doing is correct. Yeah. Well, and you've got to live your life in, in your belief. You have to own it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and own the bad, too. I mean, that's, that's one of the things. A lot of people don't want to take ownership for their life. So they allow the opinion to push them around so that then they have something to blame it on. You are so right with that <laughs> comment. I mean, you are spot on with that. Um, what, what do you think is something that you would throw into that things we think but do not say category? Oof. Well, in our sport, mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's negative things that you can pick up. And mm-hmm. so many people will promote the negative. Oh, if it was like this, if it was like that. Well, that's the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. We all see it. We can talk about it. 
But what I want to know is how can we change it? Mm -hmm. How can we be, how can we make it better? Yeah. So I keep that in my head, but I would love to just, you know, say it more to people like, Hey, listen, we see it too. You're not the only one and don't take pride in speaking out on it because you're just stating the obvious. Yeah. Take pride in doing something positive to change it. Yeah. And change is hard and getting people to accept change is hard. Uh, we've noticed that because there's actually something you and I are working together on to try to help bowling in, and that's in the merchant services or credit card processing part of, of the bowling proprietor space and trying to get them to understand that they can save money to put back in their business or they can use that. They can leverage that, uh, through a program that we have at charge forward solutions in order to fund their youth programs and everybody's just so stuck in their head that they're resistant to change. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things we're, we're over here going, Hey, we're willing to help. <laughs> we want to be great for bowling. We want to help you grow bowling specifically in your youth programs, but to, to keep centers open and still it's, it's like pulling teeth. It's a no brainer. What you're doing is awesome. And, uh, I think some people are just not motivated enough to go. It's going to take a little bit of work to figure out, but the upside is great. And it's a, it's like a no, it's just a no brainer because they're really not having to put that much work in. Cause I mean, quite honestly, you're doing the work, right? You just need the information to work with. That's right. Well, and it was born out of, you know, the, the youth program in, uh, in Clarksville actually is, you know, and like most youth programs, it's the same kids that they get to come around with the 50, 50 bucket or the same, uh, fundraising program every week. And it just wears everybody out. And it's not that they don't care about the youth program. It's just, they bowl three nights a week and they've been hit up all three nights and it's already expensive enough <laughs> to bowl all three nights and to have new equipment and all the things. And so it was really kind of born out of that space of, okay, how else could we look at this? How could we automate the fundraising so that it didn't cost the proprietor any money so that it didn't, you know, it, it kind of automated the, the funds coming into the youth program. And we've really, we've got an amazing program. It's just getting people to listen long enough to understand just how great it is. And so I'm excited to keep working with you on that front uh, to really try to make an impact. Absolutely. Looking forward to uh, keeping that going, even from afar. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, one of the, one of the big things that we've obviously talked about quite a few times throughout this is getting that mindset, right? What is something else outside of mindset that you think that regardless of whether we're talking about the sport of bowling, another sport, or just in daily life, what is something somebody can, can take from our conversation and go, you know what, I'm going to plug that in, in order to make my life better. Well, I mean, nothing happens without action, right? That's right. So if I, if I want to get up, if I'm hungry, I have to get up and go grab some food, right? That's right. But that's easy because we, we're hungry and we need something. Well, you need to be hungry, mm -hmm. right, to go do something different, to be able to grow. Uh, but you have to, you can only get that through action. Uh, to, to sit there and hope that it happens I mean, it's just not the right recipe for success. It takes action. And you know it, we've all heard it. Action speaks louder than words. When it goes back to that accountability piece, because if I'm expecting it to come to me, then I have somebody else to blame. Whereas if I take control of it, taking that action and taking on that accountability puts me in a better spot, good, bad, or ugly. I may fail, but if I learn something along the way, I'm more likely to get back up and try again. And, you know, I think throughout your entire career, you have charged forward right into the storm in order to come out better on the other side. Yeah. And you know, when you're saying that, it, it does uh, remind me of some of the conversations I have with my college kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I would always tell them, you know, if you don't own every shot, good or bad, you have to own the bad ones That's right. to grow. Right. You can't grow unless you accept that to grow from. If everything's if you if you're perfect in everything you're doing, there is no growth, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, 
people would like to blame others yeah. for their for their space that they're in. That's right. Um, we we actually do not have time to dive deep into this one, but the next time I have you on, I want us to talk specifically to bowlers out there and give them a nugget on surface, because. I did not, I still don't fully understand surface, but when you were teaching your college team, I, I came out and we, we had a couple of chats and I learned more about bowling ball surface in just our couple of conversations than I, than I have in the last 20 X years. And I think that is just a critical piece that more people need to know and understand. It's the greatest tool in your bag. That's right. It really is. Um, we can buy bowling balls all we want. Uh, of course, practice makes the bowler better. But once you are better, better ball motion mm -hmm. makes the, the, the bowler better. And so that's where surface comes in. Yeah, it's those tweaks and you understanding it well enough in order to do it is, mm -hmm. is the difference. Absolutely. Um, now, I noticed your shirt there. We've got, some, we've got some mutual friends. We both love the guys over at Brunswick. Yep. So I think we give them a, a big shout out today. Um, They've, they've been with you the whole way, right? They have. They've supported me in my bowling, and they certainly support me in my coaching. Um, they know that that's really where my love is now. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm still competitive in what I do on the lanes, uh, they see the greater benefit in what I'm doing is going out there and making other people better. Yeah, absolutely. It's the impact. It's the impact that you have. And, uh, and I'm thankful for great people like Brian Graham, uh, over there, you know, hidden, leading the way. It doesn't help that we have awesome people. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. Bugsy. Another. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, now let's just say hypothetically, we're going to have a bowling challenge on TV. Everybody is going to be watching our, it's our job to make sure that we put together the right team so that as many eyes as possible get on it. You're captain of the team. Who are your four bowlers? Well, I mean, if you're drawing to today's crowd. Mm -hmm. Anybody and everybody. Yeah. I mean, my my dream would be able to pull the grades from each, you know. Era? Each era. Okay. So yeah. who, who are we putting on the team? Well, Dick Weber. I mean, because okay. he had such an impact in my life. Yeah. Uh, being on the same staff and traveling and seeing him work with people and whatnot. So Dick Weber, for sure. Uh, Mark Roth, Marshall Holman, one of those two would have to be on my team. Going through uh, up until the two-handed, Walter Ray has won more than anybody and still has. And I feel like he doesn't get full respect for that. But who wouldn't want that guy on your team when you need one? Well, and I think that is from, a, you know, I don't want to say he's a quiet player, but he gets it done and he steps off the lane. And I think especially at that time, the TV ratings needed somebody with more pizzazz. And it was kind of one of those things where Walter get up there and his pizzazz is making the shot over and over and over and over and making it look easy. Yeah. You know, but for some, it was it's easy not every enough. time he bowled me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, then you had someone like Norm Duke who did play to the crowd, mm -hmm. who people fell in love with, but hadn't won as much as Walter. Yeah. And yet they look at him as being one of the greatest ever because there was that appeal, right? That showmanship. Yep. Yeah. So who's, who's the last one on, on, on the team? Well, I mean, Belmonte has had such an impact on the sport that I'd want him on my team because he's been able to do so much. And let's be honest, he's been very successful on the lanes, but more successful social, in social media. Yeah. Something that a tool that we never had to build on mm -hmm. when we were at you know in our you know in our career where we we're drawing people mm -hmm. uh, to the sport, he's been able to be really successful in that. And so, yeah, for what he's done for the sport, absolutely. Yeah. And it seems like he's got a good balance on it all, and and that you know got a got a growing family, and you know obviously having to split time you know, in the States and abroad, and then obviously there in, then in Australia, which, you know, you guys traveled quite a bit, Europe and Japan, et cetera, throughout your career too. Yeah, it's a long trip, right? So <laughs> he makes that trip all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. Yeah. 
It really is. Uh, he's done more travel than anybody to play on tour. That's right. And that's, that's that drive. That's that passion for it. And at the same time, he's, you know, I've never met his wife, but I'm sure she's, she's got to be an amazing sports system in order to get out there and do that. Well, there's, you know, thing about being on tour and even though he, he's traveling continents, mm -hmm. um, I'm just traveling, you know, from my home base, but there's a lot of lonely time for our spouses. Mm -hmm. They're home, they're taking care of things, they're taking care of the kids, you know, um, and we're out doing what we're doing, providing for them, yes, but talk about an amazing person that will go through that and support what you're doing and yet still having to deal with everything while you're out there doing what you love. Yeah. And then not make you feel a certain way about it when you get back. Though you do. You know. I mean, well, you, you I always do. felt there's, guilty. There's, there's always going to be that. But, yeah. but knowing that they're supporting you and that this is a team effort changes the way it feels long term. Yep. Yeah. Well, whenever we were having dinner and things were running along and I needed to make a phone call home, guess where I was at? That's right. And You're everyone was it. like, why didn't you hang out with us? I'm like, I'd rather hang out with my, my family. Yeah. You know, yeah. nothing personal, guys. Absolutely. Um, all right. We have a little bit of fun with this one, kind of tagging along with the, uh, the uh, bowling team. I think I know, probably know the answer, but who's going to commentate this bowling team in order to get the crowd fired up in order to raise as much money as possible for charity? Well, I did speak on you know, the voice of, of bowling in my mind, um, but you'd have to throw Bo Burton in okay. with that because you know, that was the team. Uh, when we were on ABC Sports. So Chris Shankle, Bo Burton, I think they, they they balance each other very well. Yeah, absolutely. What an amazing team there. Yes. That's great. Um, what if you – I'm going to change it just a little bit. If you had to pick a doubles partner today to go out and bowl one event, who would you want to bowl with? Wow, that's a tough one. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make it even tougher throughout history. Anybody alive or otherwise? You know, I never got to see Don Carter bowl, but he was obviously amazing. He had an unbelievable streak prior to the tour starting in nineteen fifty-eight. Mm -hmm. Um and so I never got to see him on the lands, never got to compete against him, but he had to be just an amazing player and so to be able to spend time on the lanes with you know Don as uh, a choice for a, a man mm -hmm. uh, you had Marion Ledwick and uh, honestly Judy Sutar mm -hmm. or Judy uh, Odsley was her name she was a phenom uh, in her teens she bowled professionally yeah so there's 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 a, a number of players that you could choose, but I would just think someone I haven't had a chance to compete with yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not many people know this, but Don Carter was the first million dollar athlete. He had the first million dollar contract in any sport. Yes. I did not know that. And that was in bowling. That's huge. That's huge. Um, yeah, I did not know that. You know, one of the things that strike me is a lot of times, you know, when to make that call, like you were talking about when you called Stacy, but I think you do that with your friends too, even those you haven't talked to in a long time. And the reason I say that is, uh, after we did that event in 2009 in Vegas, I guess it was 2012. I got asked to, to be the grand opening entertainment, uh, with Johnny Petraglia down at, uh, Disney's first bowling center. And we were on, I think, 75 channels. Basically, we just went lane to lane to lane. I threw one ball. He threw one ball. And whatever they got was what they got. And, of course, they all wanted strikes. And they wanted trick shots. And you, you name it. They wanted all the things. And out of the blue, you know, I'm headed back to Nashville. And you gave me a call and said, hey, I heard you got to bowl with my good buddy Johnny down in, down in Disney. I heard you did great. And I needed that phone call. I, you know, it was a, my dad had gone down there with me that week, uh, not too, not too different than this week and actually got an infection and had to be flown home to have emergency surgery. And so he actually missed, uh, being there for, for the event when, when Johnny and I, uh, went live 
and then kind of repeating that this this week. So I think it's just uh, opportune timing that <laughs> we were supposed to be in the studio today. Well, I always appreciate uh, time in front of you, man. Uh, we do speak, you know, the same language, uh, and again, being around pe- positive people, you oh, know, yeah. I can't spend, I it's there, not enough time spent around people like yourself. Well, I think we get to choose who we spend our time with most of the time. And I think the older we get, the more selective we are with that because we go, you know what? I've only got X number of days. I don't know how many days that will be left on this planet, but I'm not going to spend it with somebody that, that pulls the energy out of me. It's right. that, um, it's that creative energy that, that creates more when, when two people with a positive mindset or positive energy between them, cr- it creates. And so we're both better for it. I agree. I love it. How do you want to be remembered? Um, certainly as someone who cared, you know, um, truly there for the right reasons. I think, um, it's not something I'm, it's not a concerted effort. It's just who I am. And, uh, I just feel like that I made a difference, right? Mm -hmm. I I received a lot from the sport. I really did, uh, beyond my imagination. What a, what a, what a big adventure. Yeah. And I mean, it's still ongoing. I mean, you got a huge adventure in front of you, but I mean, how many years has it been? I, I know that's going to put, put a time on it, but, uh, from when I started the tour. Yeah. Um, as a, well, my first time out was in 1982. There you go. So uh, it's been a long, a long time and a great experience. Um, yeah, there was a few bumps. Uh, certainly when we lost ABC sports, mm-hmm. that was a tough one for our sport yeah. in general, but, um, man, everything that's happened positive. And then really my feeling is, uh, again, not a concerted effort so much, but giving back to the sport that gave me so much. Yeah. And I, I, I see that. I think everybody does see that, uh, that is looking and paying attention to what you do on, on, on the lanes and kind of behind the scenes you know, uh, a lot of the manuals and th- things that got updated, you know, in the early 2000s at USBC, I mean, it's got your fingerprints all over it. Yeah, that was a, a great experience to be able to go through and uh, bring it forth, you know, uh, into the modern game, being part of that process. Uh, something I truly was, in, I never thought I'd be that excited about mm-hmm. writing things, you know, and, uh, uh, where commas matter, you know, like let's eat mom, uh, grandma or let's eat grandma, you know, one of those <laughs> things. It matters in, in a manual mm-hmm. and how it's written, how it's spelled out so people's interpretation is correct. Well, I think it also tells the person reading it whether or not the person creating it cared. And so you had, you had an opportunity to reshape that for the future. And I, I think that's arguably one of your biggest contributions aside from all the things that everybody would already notice. But, you know, this is in the manuals. This is what people are reading that, you know, are studying to be the next coaches or to understand it. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I had took a lot of pride in the time we put into that. Certainly, um, it was a unique opportunity. I've been very blessed in, in being able to be part of different facets of the sport. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't take that lightly. No, I know you don't. And I think that's, that's also why you're good at it is because you know the impact that it has downstream and you're, you're, you're creating it with them in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, maybe out of ego, people create it with them in mind as opposed to the end user and what it does long-term. Yeah. So Bob, what are you most excited about? The future. Yeah. Right. I mean, what does the future hold? You know, um, you know, it's, you talked about career career is, is something that as a player, you're not thinking about, you're thinking about the next week, the next Mm -hmm. performance. And then at some point in time, someone says something about a career. And to me, that makes me think that I'm done doing that. Right. Because that's marked an era of, of who I was, because that was, that was my career, Mm -hmm. but I feel like my career is still uh, happening and it's only because I'm looking for the, the next best thing to do. Well, I think you're evol- you're still evolving into the person you're supposed to become. And I think, I think all too often people settle for who they are 
versus for who they're supposed to be. And once you settle, once you get into that rut, it takes a lot more effort in order to get out of it and, and take action. And I think it's because you've been taking action the whole time, understanding that this is going to evolve. Bob is going to evolve. Stacy is going to evolve. Bowling is going to evolve. Whereas a lot of people are very resistant to that. And it's because they have this closed mindset of it's supposed to fit in this box or it's supposed to fit in this lane. And, you know, it's, it's change that keeps it interesting and, uh, you know, causes new bowlers to come to the sport. Yeah. Well, we live in a world of change, right? Absolutely. So you can adapt or you can, or you can go away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good deal. Well, Bob, thank you so much for coming in and spending some time with me today. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. That's I really awesome. appreciate the opportunity. Well, and you know, one of my one of my favorite things is the fact that we are friends. That well, you I know, cherish that friendship as well. All these many years later, well, perfect team. You heard it here on the Charge Ford podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mr. Bob Learn Jr., Mister Three Hundred, and hearing about his experiences on tour and mindset and just how he has shaped this life into what an adventure it has been and what it will be. I hope you're as excited about the future as we are here. Until next time, Charge Forward. Team, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Charge Forward podcast. Look forward to other amazing guests. And until next time, I'm your host, Jim Cripps. Special thanks, as always, to Nick Heider and the creative team at Hit Lab Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee. Special thanks to our sponsors, Sense Custom Development and Charge Forward Solutions. Please be sure to like and subscribe.